Welcome back to Sub Brief. I'm your host, Aaron. Today we're talking about Russia's Doomsday Torpedo. We have to go all the way back to the Cold War, 1952, to, to begin to look at Russia's Doomsday Torpedo ambitions. There was a facility on the coast of the Black Sea in the Southern Caucasus called the Scientific Research Institute 400, which was later renamed to the Central Research Institute. <clears throat> and this is where they would build a lot of their special weapons, including different variations of torpedoes, one of which was a nuclear torpedo. So they begin developing this in 1952. And here you can see some of the pictures of the actual laboratory as it stands today. And I want to thank vmolder.livejournal.com for some fantastic photos of what this complex looks like today. How it was just abandoned after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They left a lot of the equipment there, as you can see. Uh, presumably none of these are armed, but uh, quite an insightful journey into what the Scientific Research Institute uh, is today. So thank you to V. Mulder. All right, back to our story. Two years after 1952, it's 1954, they're gonna begin testing the first miniaturized nuclear warhead called RDS-9. They take this warhead to the Kazakhstan testing site where they do initial tests. The initial tests fail. They simply uh, explode the conventional part of the warhead, but it doesn't cause a chain reaction to the plutonium inside. So it's a failed test. They go back to the drawing board and they come up with three new designs, different shaped charges, different timings, different amounts of explosives. Um, so different variants of the same miniaturized bomb that will fit in a 53 centimeter chassis. And they test it again in July, 1955, the following year. They get one of the three designs to work and that's good enough for the Kremlin. So we're gonna go forward with testing. The one explosion that did work yielded 3.5 kilotons of a reaction. They're moving this RDS-9 with this working configuration now that fits inside this 53 centimeter torpedo to the Novaya Zemila test site. This nuclear test site is pretty famous in world history because this is also where they tested the Tsar bomb. The largest nuclear uh, explosion ever tested was done here at this test site but they're gonna go off the coast this time. They're gonna anchor this RDS-9 12 meters below the surface off the coast, and they're gonna set up some test ships around it, some right overhead and some out at 300 meters all the way out to 3,000 meters to see how destructive the force is. They explode the warhead on September 21st, 1955, only two short months after their successful test in Kazakhstan, and they sink every ship within 50 meters or 500 meters of the explosion. So this is a successful tactical use of nuclear weapons against naval ships. It's called the T-5 nuclear torpedo, and here you can see the uh, scientists putting it together. So what is the RDS-9? They call it the compact nuclear warhead. It is the smallest nuclear warhead Russia has built up to this time. It is made out of plutonium-239. It fits in a torpedo body that is eight meters long, and the torpedo can dive down to depths of up to 35 meters and still function. It has a maximum speed of 40 knots and a maximum range of 10 kilometers. The idea is to shoot this straight running torpedo in the direction of a NATO convoy or fleet or carrier group, uh, let it run out 10 kilometers and explode the 3.5 kiloton nuclear warhead. That's how this is gonna be employed should the Cold War turn hot. So the T-5 is actually tested in um, October 10th, 1957. This is another two years have passed since the initial trials. They put the warhead in a 53 centimeter modified torpedo. They modified a 5357 thermal torpedo, renamed it the 5358. A quick note about torpedo names, the first number, 53, is the size in centimeters, the diameter of it. So you see a lot of 53s because it's a very common size. The second number is the year it's operational. So uh, they call this the 1958 because that's when it's going to go operational. The engine is changed. It's redesigned from its original use to use oxygen and alcohol as fuel. 
Uh, it does produce 460 horsepower, so a pretty good engine. And it shot from the S144, which is a whiskey class diesel boat during the test. The test happens on October 10th, 1957, and it is successful. They now have a working nuclear torpedo that yields 3.5 kilotons. During this time, there is another torpedo idea floated out to the design community. They call this one the T-15. This is being designed in tandem with the T-5 that we just watched. The idea of the T-15 is to be a strategic nuclear weapon. It is going to destroy regions of coastlines. It is a 40-ton torpedo. It's the largest torpedo that they're ever going to build. It's 1.5 meters in diameter. It's huge. It's thick. It's a 24 meters long, and it will carry a 100 megaton warhead, the equivalent of two Tsar bombs. It's big enough where they could literally put two Tsar bombs back to back in it to get this 100 megaton warhead. But that's the design, that's the intention that they're going to modify the November SSN, which is the new nuclear fast attack, fast attack for the 50s anyway, uh, the November is designed to go out with eight torpedo tubes normally and attack shipping. It's, it can do ASW, but it's designed for anti-shipping missions. Well, what they want to do is strip out six of the eight torpedo tubes and put this one large diameter torpedo tube beneath two conventional torpedo tubes and shoot this T-15 strategic nuclear torpedo. Um, so the, the idea is to go out and be ready to destroy entire harbors, whether it's New York, LA, Seattle, you know, in the event of war with America. Thankfully, the Admiral of the Russian Navy at the time, Admiral Kuznetsov, is quoted as saying, and famously so, I do not need this kind of sub in my Navy. And so they did not build this, and they went about building the uh, Project 627 uh, no Novembers, which they built a lot of. And we have a sub brief off too over on the Patreon side if you want to learn more about it. But this closes the chapter on strategic nuclear torpedoes for the Cold War until the collapse of the Soviet Union, when this gentleman rises to power. This is Vladimir Putin, who is the current president of the Russian Federation. And in October 2001, after the 9-11 attacks and the world is distracted by terrorism, they quietly restart another program, one that is not necessarily directly connected to any kind of strategic nuclear torpedo, but they pull out an old hull that's been sitting in an assembly building since the 80s called Sargan. And they put it on a floating dry dock and they tow it to the Sevmash machine building shop in Sevmash, Russia. The Sargon is uh, a modified kilo that they're going to modify even farther in uh, 2001. And they work on this quietly for about six years until 2007, the Russian Navy comes out with order number 25. Order number 25 initiates project 20120 of which B-90 Sarov is the only submarine part of that program. One of the things that the intelligence community notices right away is the shape of the submarine has changed significantly, as you can see here in the pictures. It has lots of bulbous blisters added to the top side, the side, and the bow, and there is a large door on the bow. What does the large door hide? What does it cover? It is one large torpedo tube that comes out the bow. It is 1.5 estimated meters in diameter, and she leaves the assembly building and begins uh, sea trials or operations in August 2008. Now, this 1.5 meter diameter torpedo tube um, isn't initially connected to the T-15 in the intelligence community. Uh, we think that it might be a sealed delivery vehicle for like a mini sub that special forces can use, uh, or it could be used for any sorts of storage and testing. A nuclear strategic t torpedo is the furthest things from anyone's imagination. For the next three years, B-90 Sarov operates in its testing platform capacity. It's not a combatant at all. It is testing high temperature turbine generators. It's testing the new, for the time, hydrogen fuel cells, which will eventually replace batteries and submarines, and other weapons testing as well. 
Three years later, November 2015, during a televised meeting between some Russian generals, admirals, and Vladimir Putin, uh, we see an over-the-shoulder camera shot for just a few seconds of this handout right here that shows a new torpedo. A torpedo that has a large labeled nuclear warhead is approximately one and a half di meters in diameter and has a nuclear propulsion engine on the back of it. A nuclear propelled nuclear weapon in the shape of a torpedo. Above this, we see two submarines outlined. One is clearly the Belgorod because it has um, the low shark under it and the uh, shelf power pot on the top side. And the second submarine appears to be a modified Yasin. So how is this torpedo program and these new uh, submarines going to be related? <clears throat> So this is the problem that the, uh, the United States and NATO intelligence agencies begin trying to solve at this time. Well, in 2018, you don't need to be guessing anymore because Vladimir Putin, in his annual presidential address, comes out with the full details of the program as much as he wants to release to the public, including a video that he showed to everybody of what he called Status 6 Poseidon. That's the Russian name for this program. The CIA name is Canyon presumably because that's what it would make if it blew up. So what is Poseidon status six? What is this? This is a 1.6 meter in diameter torpedo. It is 24 meters long. It is estimated to make about 54 knots and that's based on the size of the propeller, the amount of torque they expect a small nuclear reactor to, to uh, build and the, um, the mass of the whole unit, which is rather large. Now, the big thing about this is because it's nuclear propelled, the range is no longer measured in miles like it is for conventional weapons or even ballistic weapons. Because this has a nearly limitless fuel source, the range is measured in months. It's measured in time now. So this weapon can stay at sea for months at a time between maintenance periods. This is what makes this weapon a game changer, is that it's no longer limited in range by fuel or by physics. It's limited in range by the nuclear power it has in its power plant. <clears throat> the next thing is the warhead. According to Vladimir Putin's own words, this weapon is measured in tens of megatons. So tens bling pearl uh, would be somewhere between 20 megatons and less than 100. So we're going to say 90 megatons, somewhere in this range. And because of the size of the weapon, they certainly could put that much of a warhead, a nuclear warhead in this. It would easily fit inside this body. What is more diabolic about this is that Vladimir Putin bragged in a sociopathic way that this would salt or contaminate entire shorelines with what is expected to be cobalt 60. This is called a salted nuclear weapon. So that not only does the nuclear blast destroy things, and in this case, the tsunami tidal wave destroy things, as that water recedes, it leaves in its wake on the land uh, contamination. Cobalt 60, highly radioactive, has a long half-life and will take hundreds of years to become um, livable again. The land will just be un untainable for hundreds of years after this weapon uh, shoots this radioactive tidal wave onto the land. And we'll come in two variants. There's a stealth variant and a super cavitating variant. The stealth variant is going to be slower than the 54 knots, even though it could reach 54 knots. It is going to slowly sneak towards the coastline at a reduced speed and trying to be quiet to get around uh, SOSIS and other detections, um, you know, arrays out there and then explode. The second variant, which we've not seen yet, but they've talked about building is a super cavitating one that will go after our fleets. Now the super cavitating has a couple problems in that the way super cavitation works currently with torpedoes is they use a rocket motor and this doesn't have a rocket motor. So how they uh, solve that problem will be interesting to find out whenever they begin testing that. But we have not seen the super cavitating version of the Poseidon yet. Who was gonna launch this weapon? This is very important. Well, it's gonna be two submarines for now. The one is the Belgorod, who is going to be operational in 2021, is doing sea trials right now. It's almost ready. The second one is the Khabarovsk, which is that modified Yasin, uh, is going to be operational, scheduled to be operational in 2022. We'll see if that actually happens. But these are the two platforms that are going to be shooting this weapon, the strategic nuclear weapon. So what has been America's response to this? Well, in uh, 2018, 
uh, General Mattis, someone who I have enormous respect for, said that status six will change absolutely nothing. And I think this is because we might have been caught flat footed or we don't have a defense for this, I think is really why he's saying this. Because whenever it comes to ballistic missile defense, we've had theater ballistic missile defense in a program and proving that for decades now. We don't have anything that will counter this threat from the sea. The thing that makes this weapon different from, say, a ballistic missile or other nuclear weapons, I should say, is that it is autonomous. It works on its own like a drone, but we don't have any nuclear drones until now. So if we were to compare this to a bomber with a nuclear weapon, the bomber has a crew and a fuel supply, whereas this weapon does not need a crew. It's completely autonomous after it's launched and it's nuclear powered. So it doesn't have a fuel limit. You know, it can stay at sea for months until the reactor breaks down, which may happen, or it needs maintenance, which it certainly will need. So, but how long will it operate between maintenance period? That's really the question. It's estimated to be months at a time between maintenance periods. So the loiter time is really what makes this so different, is that these weapons can run racetrack patterns in deep sea oceanic, you know, abyssal planes out of the, uh, you know, envelope of even deep diving torpedoes and just wait for activation, wait for the orders to go. Uh, they can be deployed, uh, deployed off any coast in the globe. So just because you know, you're not in Europe or if you're not in the United States, you're not safe from this. This, this is a global weapon, it can go anywhere. Uh, again, there's no active defense at this time for this weapon. We need to come up with something if we're gonna have a defense. Uh, it was tested from the Sarov, that's that diesel boat we talked about, in 2016. Testing on this system has been going on now for four years. They're very far along in making the system work. And they intend on building 30 of these. Yeah, 30. So this is what Russia sees the future as uh, going into the 2020s and beyond, is an environment in which large nuclear autonomous weapons patrol the oceans waiting for orders to respond or be activated or deployed uh, around the globe. This is what Russia sees the future being uh, for warfare going forward from here. Uh, a lot of people don't know about this program, which is why I make these videos. Uh, I think this is the biggest threat our generation faces in terms of nuclear weapons and the fact that nobody knows about this program is very disturbing to me. So I hope that you uh, share this video and uh, get it out there, pass it to your friends, let people know that this program exists and the United States and NATO does not have a counter to it right now. All right, well, I wanna say thank you to H.I. Sutton for his invaluable information and V. Mulder at livejournal.com for the great pictures. Uh, thank you for supporting the sub brief here and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching everybody, bye.